Bring your questions in, will you? Because, I mean, in getting down to some of the criticism that you've been making of the sector, then we'll need to hear from you. <laughs> we'll need to hear your uh, responses, your defences, if you like, and your, um, your counter-arguments. <coughs> um, but a good place to begin, um, I think, Adrian, might be with you, which is what role the actuarial profession has to bring, has to bring about financial sustainability for insurers? Uh, a pretty critical one, I would have thought. Uh, I mean, the question, I guess, talks a little bit more specifically about uh, the quality of, of advice and insights that the profession is giving in the group space as an example. And I think our observation would be it has improved uh, quite markedly since uh, we first started looking at that in detail probably five or six years ago. Uh, the awareness of the risks and the things that can go wrong in that part of the business. Um, and I think that's just, a, I guess, a, a broader... An example of uh, the evolution of the profession and the fact that, you know, the business environment is more challenging and there is the need to be ever more diligent and, and clever about how you look at the, the problems that, that you face. So, uh, yeah, look, I think... The, the actuarial profession is absolutely critical. And the review we've been doing, uh, which very much started from industries thinking around the role of the appointed actuary and some concerns that perhaps it wasn't seen or wasn't able to spend as, as much time on the critical issues as it had in the past and was getting a bit overwhelmed by what industry saw as compliance and, and detailed issues. Uh, I guess our, our review there has, has taken, I guess, the information that both the Institute uh, has worked on as well as some work the FSC did and will be uh, feeding back to industry, I think, fairly soon uh, our, res our, our views on the responses we got to that consultation. So, Justin, I'll come to you in a moment sort of, you know, I guess for the more innovative point of view, if you like, from uh, of sustainability in terms of starting a, uh, entering into a new sector in, in a new way. But um, I, I guess I'd just it'd be interesting to hear sort of Siddharth and Adrian, I think, engage a little bit here because some of the observations you were making, Siddharth, about you know, whether there was a cultural problem there or not, and the, the, um, the market's being concerned about that. Adrian, maybe you can address that. Uh, yeah, is there a cultural problem? I guess that was in the context of the... the well, well, let's get Siddharth to explain that yeah. further, first of all. What, 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 what is the perceived cultural problem? Well, I, I think the questions that I've asked, that I've had put to me by fund managers is, do life insurers just have a culture of starting off by denying claims that they should otherwise have, that they might otherwise have to pay? Um, and you know, my my experience in the industry is that everyone tries to do their best and do, and has a view that they should pay all legitimate claims. The difficulty is that I think that there are difficulties around definitions. There's difficulties of creep, and maybe um, it's just very difficult to define things like what is a traumatic event, for instance. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, and it can look very bad. When things get flashed across a newspaper, things can look extremely, extremely bad. And you know, as I said, when people have five or 10 minutes of attention time to, to, to look at an issue, they don't have the time to go down and really understand what might be, what might the, what might be the other point of view. Uh, Adrian, I'll get you to speak here, but look, this is where I really wish I had microphones in the audience so that I could really hear from you right now. So get on your phones and, um, and please send in your points of view, your observations, your questions, so we can sort of drill down into this a little bit more. Adrian? Yeah, look, given it's a live matter, uh, and both us and, and ASIC are doing some work in the area, I probably don't want to say too much about it. Uh, other than to note, I think, I think what Siddharth said is right. I mean, you start from the presumption that people are trying to do the right thing. Uh, that doesn't always work. Uh, we recently did a, a submission to the Senate committee that's looking into this issue along with some other advice-related matters. And I guess we've highlighted again the complexity created by legacy products. Legacy products are unfortunately an inevitable part of life insurance because of the, the nature of the business where it's guaranteed renewable. So it does add complexity over time. And it can't be easy if you're working in a claims department having to administer policies that may have been written a very long time ago mm. and trying to make very technical interpretations of you know, various definitions of illness, yeah. which may not resonate very simply with, with the public. So it's a difficult issue. Uh, and I guess the focus we're having on it is to look at the role the board and senior management have in the governance of the overall process. ASIC's looking at some very different issues. Um, yeah, that's probably what, all I want to say. But it would sound, unless I'm wrong, the impression I get from listening to the two of you is that, um, Adrian, you, you seem to have, or your, your, um, the, the regulator seems to have a better uh, or, or a more sympathetic understanding of the, the pricing pressure that the insurers are after, are under, um, more so Siddharth than perhaps 
you do. I mean, you have questions there about, you know, about their policy design, about poor profitability through pricing, whereas you seem to have a broader understanding no, no, I, of the I, pressures that they're under. Pr probably empathy is a better word than sympathy, uh, <laughs> because... But, but, but That's having, a, I'm absolutely fine with that. But having said that, I mean, there's, there's clearly things the industry have done that, with at least with the benefit of hindsight, we're just not sensible. And I think the thing we're trying to focus on is what can we do to prevent that coming about again? Because there are clearly some silly decisions made. I, I think the, the hardest thing for the markets is that to rely on you know, customer behaviour to follow a particular track for six years with no safeguards. For instance, I mean, this is the issue around deferred acquisition costs where you pay a very high commission up front. I think that that's something that the market has, has had no idea about because it just didn't, didn't understand the issue. And it's just, it's amazed that the industry actually is almost, almost needs the government to come up with a solution yeah. to basically fix it. Justin, we have a question here from the audience. You talked about a snowball effect. What were the catalysts that took Go Get from fringe to mainstream? And uh, what do the rest of the panel see as the one or two biggest catalysts that will shape the life industry over the next five years? Nice question, thank you. So Justin, we'll start with you. That is a really good question. Um, I think the, the thing to realise about car share again is that it, it, hasn't, it hasn't burst onto the scene. Hmm. Um, Go Get itself is is over a decade old. Um, it seems like it has. It seems so like it, it has. It seemed like those signs just sort of sprung up one day. That's right. And and you know I think the advent of of ride sharing um, hmm. and home sharing, if that's what you call it, the whole sharing economy. The whole sharing economy has has just in the last sort of seemingly in the last two years just been thrust out there into into mainstream. But to speak to car share. Um, <clears throat> It's been something that's been happening in the background for a long time. Um, we, we've been working with city councils um, for, the, for the longest of times, o again, over, over 10 years. Um, and, and what we're seeing now is, is just a whole sort of um, range of things coming together. Uh, and and the, the time is right for car share. So to speak to those, those catalysts, you know, um, space is a problem in cities. You know, our populations are booming. Uh, and our space remains the same. You know, we have limited infrastructure, um, emissions, global warming. Um, I think through car share, there is a, a relative, there, there, there is a, a way to, to affect change, positive change, um, with few downsides. Uh, and, and that's what we're seeing. Um, and that's what we're seeing through car share. I, I think what's interesting about um, your approach, and you know, and we've seen all sorts of you know disruptive industries pop up, is that it seems as if it was a um, a private business concern that absolutely understood that it needed at the very embryonic stage to connect with government. That's right. At the local government exactly. level. Yeah, that's it. Or, or, or almost in the same way as. Um, Although, no, I was, I was going to say sort of like, you know, waste provision services that local councils use, but, but that's not a good example now that I think of it, because that was actually outsourced. That was an arm stretching out from government and right. finding those people, but this went the other way. That, that's exactly right. Um, and, and again, I, I spoke to it in the presentation. It, it's something that I find truly fascinating. It, it, there, there's no simple answer to, to you know, where, where does car sharing sit exactly? Is it public transport mm. or is it private transport or is it kind of somewhere in the middle? Mm. And that's why we, we're making these comparisons to, um, you know, to bus, bus stops yeah. uh, and train stations uh, and, and even taxi ranks. So, so what's the financial relationship to local government? How, how, did it, how did it work originally and how does it work now? So we've, the, the inner city councils, at least in Melbourne, um, ha, have gone through a period of reviewing and revising their car share policies. Um, and one of the sort of, you know, the crux of, of, of the argument was, or of the debate was, should operators pay for the, the car parks that they occupy if they're generating uh, a net com uh, community benefit. Right. And as ever, um, it went back and forth, but ultimately there was a, there was a compromise. So bays in the hodl grid, in, mm. in the inner Melbourne, th those, those are at a premium in the city of Melbourne. Outside the hodl grid in a place like Carlton, um, operators only have to pay the equivalent of a residential parking permit which is really significant right. because this sends a message to the, to the community from council yeah. that this is an, an endorsed form of transport. Okay. 
Um, and the question um, went to, to you as well, um, Siddharth and Adrian, about the, the one or two catalysts as, it, um, uh, 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 as they might affect into the future the life industry. Um, Siddharth, would you like to start? Um, well, well, I touched on it before that I think that um, one of the key issues that I think is going to play out over the next couple of years is just around retirement incomes. I think that um, um, you know, we, we're hearing more and more, and there's been a lot at this conference talking about uh, different approaches to retirement incomes. Um, until until this this year, I think that um, it hadn't really fo it hadn't really occupied much of the market's mind. Mm. Um, the market seems to be keen to try and uh, promote solutions in the space. So I, I think that that'll be one indis one area which will get a lot of focus over the next year. That's um, on the positive side. On the on the negative side, I think that. Um, you know, some of the problems that we've seen for the last couple of years on profitability still are not going away, at least with, you know, uh, with, with, with the listed players. They still seem to be there. Um, it's been a few years now since these problems first came to light. You know, if we're here in three or four years and these problems are still continuing, um, the, the, the equity markets will very much lose patience to, with, with these problems. And arguably, we're already seeing that today. You know, large owners of these businesses are looking at alternative solutions. Adrian? Yeah, probably broadly agree. I think uh, people have been trying for a long time to crack the annuity issue and, and mm. longevity protection. That doesn't seem to have quite happened yet. Uh, I guess I'd add, I'd mentioned distribution in my talk. It's the number one thing that CEOs and boards talk to us about. It's got a lot of dimensions to it, a lot of challenges, uh, and a lot of things hang off it. So the work you're seeing some insurers are doing uh, in the health, the, the broader health and lifestyle space um, seems to be one, another approach that people are taking. Uh, and I guess the, the, the extra X factor now that we're seeing is the reputational issues that the industry is facing. Let's talk a little bit about that um, reputational uh, issues. And, and you mentioned that, Siddharth, in your presentation um, with the quotation marks of scandals um, around it. Um, uh, just expand a little bit, if you can, on the market's perspective there, because clearly there seems to be some anxiety there. Yeah, I, I mean, look, as I, as, as I said before, I think that um, the, the, the questions really are around culture and just whether uh, the, the, you're just going to see more and more issues and whether, you know, I suppose there's also change in, um, this, this is coupled with FOFA, where you actually have changes in the way planners are meant to act. They're meant to act in the consumer's, yeah. best, the, the consumer's best interest, where there wasn't an explicit requirement for that before, there's just a fear that once this actually plays out, of which, um, I mean, for the best interest duty only came live, I think, 1st July last year. Um, effectively, there, there are real concerns that we will just see ongoing issues for the next, uh, for the next several years play out because, um, you know, this is all relatively new for the market and it's just, um, you know, they, as I said, they in some ways are losing patience with, with, the, with, this, with this industry. Adrian? I'll look I think the, the conversation we've had with um, boards and senior management in recent years has very much been around the frustration that in a lot of the areas that ASIC looks into, they find more and more things. And uh, that uh, doesn't reflect well on industry. Uh, and I think it really begs the question of how can industry get on top of that and uh, fix whatever issues or whatever underlying causes there are to these things that, that ASIC is finding, whether it's in the advice space, commissions, and I guess the more recent examples. Do you, actually, do, you, do you have a, um, a strong view on, on, on what you think it is, on, on which of those issues it might be, or whether it's all of them, and what no, drives we, that? No, we don't have a strong view. I think we're still uh, trying to, I guess, get information from industry about what they're seeing and how, how they're overseeing what, what they're doing in this space. And uh, I think the challenge for industry, is, as Siddharth said, is that it faces some upheaval now as it gets to the, the bottom of those things. And it just creates uncertainty and it's, it's a difficult situation for industry. The issue of reputation is really important from the equity market's perspective because um, most of the Australian uh, wealth managers, uh, banks and insurance companies all traded significant premiums to net tangible assets, much more so than anywhere else in the world. So a lot of the value is not in the tangible side of assets, it's mm. in the goodwill. And yeah. it really is in the, ability, the likelihood that consumers will stay where they are. So um, there's a lot of value wrapped up in that uh, you know, expectation that consumers will be happy to continue with their existing, uh, their existing uh, relationships. I'll come back to a little bit more of this, but I wanted to include um, Justin here. And 
I'm wondering when you're sort of at the, at the forefront of a, of a new business model like this, how then you manage for or plan for financial sustainability when you're sort of about to jump off a cliff? It's <laughs> In a car. <laughs> Hopefully not a go-get. <laughs> um, no, that little funny old Datsun. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but that's a, a great question. Um, and and, and go-get prides itself on being um, innovative. Um, and I think, you know, I think if we are disruptors, I, I think we're reluctant disruptors. Why? Because we are part of the solution. Um, disruptive, it kind of entails that there's, you know, you, it, it's disrupting for, in a bad sense almost. There's a sort of connotation. But, but we're part of a solution. We, we want to, we want to, we're working towards more livable communities. And, you, tra and transport is a massive uh, a, a factor in that. Do you regard Uber as part of the solution? Well, ride sharing certainly is, is an, has a place in intermodal transport. Um, we, we don't pretend that car sharing is the be-all and end-all of transport. Um, sometimes a, a taxi is, is what I need. Uh, if, if I've got a meeting in the CBD, uh, and I don't want to contend with parking, I'm going to use a taxi. Mm. So, so we don't propose that car share replaces all forms of transport. Um, we believe in, in intermodal and car, share, car sharing being, being one of those options. And to get back to the question, if, if we are disruptors, uh, the important thing for GoGet is that we ourselves are open to disruption. Uh, so one thing that we, we, we try and do ourselves is, um, is look to the future. Uh, to, to driverless technology. How can we better prepare ourselves for, for this inevitability? Mm. Um, and, and we're always looking at, at, at ways of changing. Um, and because car sharing is essentially an emerging industry, uh, we're learning as we go. Uh, and, and it's something that I, I personally really uh, find exhilarating in the industry. I, I love that, that you can't package car share. We don't know what to do with it exactly because it doesn't quite fit in this box or that box. And it's a conversation um, that we're kind of wrestling with. You need to have a particular mindset in order to find that uncertainty exciting, <laughs> I would imagine. <laughs> um, Siddharth, do you want to speak? I've got a question here asking you just to sort of amplify your fears of the unrecognised capital intensity of the annuity market. Sure, yeah. Look, um, so, 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 so the, the reason for making that comment is that um, the only listed player who focuses on the annuity market today um, actually uses a lot of capital or, or is required to hold a lot of capital by APRA uh, with, with good reason. I mean, they take, they take um, significant investment risk in trying to provide these, uh, uh, the, these returns for their, um, uh, for, for their policy holders. Um, so typically, if I look at Challenger today, for instance, as an example, they hold about $17 of capital for every $100 of investment assets, and that's without actually providing much in the way of longevity risk at all at the moment. Um, if we move to a world where we do introduce longevity risk, we might be, we might be required to hold maybe $25, $30 of capital for every $100 of, of assets. And if you think what that means for a $400 billion retirement incomes market today, now obviously I'm extrapolating here because not everything will go into annuities, but the amount of capital that would be required if we just take this extreme case and say everything is needed, you need $100 billion of capital. That's an, that's an enormous amount of money. That's, you know, I don't know how much is in the banks, but it would be, wouldn't, be, wouldn't be far off that, I would have thought. Yeah. Yeah. Don't have to figure out my head. Adrian, anything you want to add there? No, I mean, our, our capital standards are what they are. Uh, the provision of longevity. Oh. <laughs> they have changed. You might, you might remember logic. Uh, and look, I guess it reflects the fact that there is a lot of risk in providing longevity guarantees, yeah. and there have been markets in other parts of the world that have um, seen some significant problems arise when um, things go wrong. Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the issues is that projecting anything for 30 years is very hard to do. It's very uncertain, and if you provide a hard guarantee... Justin's nodding. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> <laughs> From a very different perspective. <laughs> if you provide a hard guarantee, it's very difficult to... Um, mm. You know, you need to hold a lot of capital to make good on that. So, uh, but from an equity holder's perspective, they want that, they want that serviced, mm. and which means there's a drain on the system, which is to service the shareholders. 
Well, Siddharth, you, you were talking about um, you know, a potential problem with the industry culture. We have a question here about customer culture. Are we too polite or too scared to call out customer misbehaviour, not disclosing illnesses, remaining on claim when they could return to work, etc.? Who should play this role? Spies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think um, the industry can't pay everything. That's, that's absolutely clear. And... Um, I mean, the, 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 the problem for the industry is that it always has to err on the side of caution. It always has to give the benefit of the doubt to the, uh, to the consumer. And I think that's actually with, with good reason because, um, um, uh, you know, it, it, is, it, is, um, it is absolutely um, <laughs> worse for them. If, if the more times they're in the paper, it's, it's you know, the worse mm. it is for them. But I do think that... Um, um, these, instance, these instances that are being called out are still in the minority. I don't think there's that many cases out there. Adrian? I don't think I've anything to add. Okay. <laughs> um, I do. Go, Justin. <laughs> our, um, our customers are members, uh, and that's significant. Um, so these people aren't using the service as a one-off. One um, mm. Members come back, um, and they regard our cars as their own cars. Um, so to a large extent, we rely on our members to keep the service running smoothly. So there's, there's sort of rules that you need to abide by as a car share member. You shouldn't bring the car back with less than a quarter of a tank of fuel. Um, you know, no, no pets in cars unless they're in designated ca um, cars with a, with a carrier and so on and so forth. Um, but it's incredibly important. Um, without the assistance of, of members on the day to day, um, car share wouldn't exist as it is now. And remember, we have a fleet of cars which live um, in bays throughout the city. Um, so lots can happen to them. And, and, and um, what percentage of your members abide by those rules? How the, would you rate it? The vast majority. Okay. And I think this so is... So 80% and higher? For sure, certainly. It's only in sort of rare circumstances that, that things don't go... Because as a car share member, you don't want to get into a car that's dirty. So by the same token, you need to take your coffee cups and, and your sure. wrappers after you. Look, I, I get that, and, and you can all call me out if I'm wrong here, but whereas you describe there a sort of a, a, a member, a, um, a fraternity, if you like, a college of people mm -hmm. who are all in the same community, by definition, with insurance, aren't you in a combative relationship? <laughs> say no, say yes. <laughs> I'm hearing sniggering. <laughs> Adrian? <laughs> Ask that group. <laughs> <laughs> Sit up. <laughs> Is no, that how it would be seen? No, right? no, I think, I mean, you've got to... You know, really? I should trust my life insurer to do right by me? I think they generally do. That's, 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 that's my perspective on... Uh, I feel like they're waiting to catch me out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think they generally uh, will err on your side. There are... I, I, I think... I mean, I won't go into issues that were raised in the Four Corners program um, here. But no, don't do that. I, no. <laughs> but I, but I, there are always two sides to, to, to these issues. And I think that, um, you know, I, I think by and large, the industry tries to do what's right for its customers. I've got a question here about whether Justin wants to appear on ABC TV to talk, raise the awareness of car share. Oh, wow. How did you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not asking that question, Justin. <laughs> but nonetheless, it's been terrific hearing from you. Please thank our panellists this morning, won't you? Justin and Adrian and Siddharth. Guys, just stay where you are. We're going to have just a little break then before your concurrence kick off at 10 a.m. and you know where they are. Just a reminder to delegates, the Connaught Room is where you need to check your PowerPoint and your slides before the presentation and the plenary this afternoon. If you have any special dietary requirements, don't forget to let the staff know. Uh, so your, the concurrent four uh, starts at 10 a.m. and then our plenary is back here at 4 p.m. So I'll see you then. Thanks so much. I have some bottles of wine for you fellas. <laughs> Oops.